Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, we're just about to start the, uh, the last session of the day, which is about greening the financial system. So if I could invite you to take your seats, please, and we'll get underway with the session. Uh, let me hand over to my colleague, uh, Selena Reiser. Selena is Head of Policy and Strategy at uh, GCF. And uh, Selena, the over to you. The floor is yours for uh, you and your panel for your session on greening the financial system. Thanks very much, Scott. Uh, good afternoon, everyone in the room. I know it's the end of what must have been a big uh, day. Hello to everyone joining us online as well. Uh, as Scott's just mentioned, my name's Selena Reiter. I'm the head of policy and strategy uh, here at the Green Climate Fund. And I know everyone has been saying this about their sessions, uh, but I really think this one on greening the financial system is the most critical session uh, and conversation of today. Uh, because here, of course, we're looking at what's happening in the world of finance outside of the work of public climate and development institutions uh, like the GCF. And we know that shifting those broader financial flows, uh, amounting to the trillions, and then expanding access to capital markets is what's critical to realize investment for climate change at the scale we know we need to meet global ambition. So the other question here, of course, is how can public institutions, including uh, public banks, where some of our panelists are from, uh, also contribute to greening the financial system? And very excited to have a wonderful and diverse panel uh, of colleagues with us uh, here today who are going to bring some quite different perspectives to this topic, uh, from research to uh, a few executives of development banks in our region, uh, as well as representatives of international organizations. So let me please welcome uh, the panelists to the stage. Uh, we have Dr. So Yong In, who's a research director of sustainable finance at Stanford University. Please just take a, a chair and make yourself comfortable. Uh, Mr. Emmanuel Herbosa, who is president and CEO of the Development Bank of the Philippines. A very warm welcome to you, uh, Emmanuel. Ms. Vaine Noana Arioka, CEO of the Bank of the Cook Islands. Likewise, thank you for joining us here today. Uh, Dr. Taeyong Park, who is a member of the International Sustainability Standard Board under the IFRS uh, Foundation. Welcome, Dr. Park. And Ms. Ruth Cotto, a portfolio manager at UNEP. Thanks for joining us on the stage, Ruth, uh, who is here uh, to speak about the UNEP FI hosted initiative on Net Zero Banking Alliance. So I will also take my place. It's a very long stage, uh, as it turns out. So it's a long way to you over there, <laughs> so long, but I can still see you. <laughs> so uh, the format will be very similar uh, to what you've seen earlier today. Uh, we'll have presentations from each of our five wonderful uh, panelists. Uh, I'll invite them either to come to the podium or to give the presentation from their seat, uh, whichever you feel most comfortable with. And of course, that will be followed by Q&A. And of course, whether you're in the room or online, you can submit your questions at any time uh, using the Q&A function in our WOVA app. So to get us kicked off, Soyong, as a research director of sustainable finance, you have basically uh, dedicated your research career to looking at sustainable finance and financial innovation. And I understand you're also looking at how to integrate technology, finance, policy, innovation to accelerate the global net zero transition. So could I ask you to kick us off uh, for this session with a bit of a view into the, the bigger picture of sustainable finance and touching on some of the key issues and trends that you're seeing in your research. Uh, please, over to you. Sure thing. Thanks, Selena, for a nice introduction. And actually, really good summary of my bio. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I think, you know, uh, it's Really grateful to open up this uh, this this panel discussion by sharing more like a bigger pictures, especially from you know like a what academic researchers are seeing you know this current trend in the market you know transitioning to net zero. So within the seven minutes, I'll be really quickly show you uh, what is the the current landscape, and then you know what are the like uh, pending 
barriers or challenges and how academic researchers are serving uh, these challenges in the market. And then lastly, you know, like where we are moving forward. So uh, those are the three key topics that I'm going to cover. So as, as per my introduction, you know, like I'm a research director of sustainable finance. And then, you know, like the most frequent question that I get is, you know, what is sustainable finance? So uh, I usually start my presentation, you know, like defining what it is or, you know, like addressing some misconception uh, about uh, sustainable finance. So I'm going to skip this one. Everyone knows that this is a really serious issue that we are racing for net zero and then we need more funding. So uh, it's very important to mobilize uh, diverse capital uh, from different funding sources. So what is sustainable finance? Uh, sustainable finance, unfortunately, do not have like a one clear definition what it is, but instead what we are def defining is uh, sustainable finance is a suite of investment activities that is geared toward transitioning net zero and climate resilient system. And the way of how you're doing it is not that different from like a traditional finance as you know here more than I do. Um, but then the next question that I usually get is, okay, someone told me that they are doing sustainable finance and they are not doing the way that I think it should be a sustainable finance. Is that greenwashing? So uh, I, I think it is more about, you know, like your own investment strategy. As far as you are clear on what is the impact that you are aimed to generating, uh, aim to generate, and also what is your own investment strategy then you know, it can be sustainable finance, but there are different kind of sustainable finance. So um, you know, let's just uh, move on to then, you know, what's the pending barriers to sustainable finance and how are academic researchers are doing while you are really investing money and then we are studying it. So uh, here's the, what we have achieved thus far, the consensus on climate change. So we do have really good um, solid consensus on uh, scientific um, effect about uh, climate change and also some level of economic consensus. However, we do not yet have like a solid market consensus that which is, you know, like a considering sustainability factors can really give you uh, economic and financial incentives. So uh, that's a big pending challenge. And there's an interesting survey uh, done with 582 institutional investors around the globe asking what is the barriers that you feel in the day-to-day -day business, you know, like uh, integrating sustainability. And I'll be highlight just top three. The first is lack of standards to, to evaluate and measure uh, ESG performance. Second is lack of the access or availability of data to measure sustainability. The third is concerns about the underperformance of sustainable finance. So uh, those three are the most uh, critical barriers in the, not only in the market, but also the most frequent and hot topic in research area as well. So let me briefly show you how we are doing, um, how academics are doing in, uh, in addressing those issues. So the first one, uh, standard for measuring sustainability. I can go quick because thankfully I have Dr. Beck on, on, on stage. So, uh, but you know, like what we are seeing as a researcher, uh, there are growing, um, you know, like a rise of like a disclosure and uh, reporting standards. But, you know, what is, what is also important to see is, you know, basically sustainability is everything around you. And then, you know, like what is your own criteria to think that this, is, this should be prioritized, this should be more evaluated and regulated, and what else can be done? So um, in uh, academic research, there's a concept that is called financial materiality. So this one is actually giving you the criteria uh, to, to to, to prioritize the sustainability issue that is more directly related to the financial performance. So that's one. The second is access to the ESG data. So uh, this good sign in the market is we are seeing rise of like the volume of uh, data providers. Uh, but the more data is always the good. I don't think so because you know we are still having a lot of problems. You know like a data inconvergency, 
uh, and then, you know, lack of guidance of using certain data. Like, I'm not saying that, you know, data in convergence is always bad, but, uh, you know, like, uh, what does it mean? So the implication is important. And uh, in the academic research, we are looking at, you know, like, a, what's the source of this, this divergence and also how we can interpret uh, those differences and so on. So uh, that's the second. And then the third one is the concerns of the underperformance of sustainable finance. So this is very important, especially for the investors uh, who, or who has a fiduciary duty, uh, which means that they have to maximize their shareholders wealth. So without uh, solid evidence that, you know, uh, compatibility of uh, sustainable finance, uh, they are they cannot move because, you know, they might breach their, their fiduciary duty. So uh, as an academic researcher, we've been, there are many research has been done to prove that one, but unfortunately, as as of today, uh, the, the, the results are still mixed. So uh, this one is like a one very active area that uh, the researchers are looking at. So uh, moving forward, you know, what we are seeing in the future of sustainable finance, I am uh, aware of the time, so I'm going to just highlight the data part. So uh, in the market, what we are seeing is we are moving from commitment to implementation, and we are becoming more specific about how to mobilize investment capital instead of why we should do that. So uh, in mobilizing capital, we have to think about the process. The process is, you know, measuring sustainability, sourcing proper assets, and align uh, the interest of different stakeholders and evaluate the impact. So those are the, the, the process we have to go through every single project or investment portfolios and investment decisions. But then, you know, we have to really think about, do we have uh, transparent, reliable data that is accessible? Um, you know, what is a good sign is that we are seeing the data market is gr uh, growing, but the problem is, you know, who is actually providing the data points? It is actually the companies who are providing the data. And then that is actually being aggregated, collected, aggregated, and utilized by the end users, which is usually financial institutions. However, we are less concerned about, you know, increasing the ability or capacity, uh, capability of the companies to provide a, a, a reliable and transparent information, which is something that we should also be very much concerned, uh, especially for the SMEs. Uh, you know, like we are globally connected, so they are going to be uh, soon be pressured from not only their local government or regulatory bodies, but also their global market chains. So you have to really think about, you know, how we can grow the capability of SMEs. And then lastly, you know, how can we utilize those data, you know, like alternative data, what we can call, because most of the, uh, you know, uh, ESG data these days are actually coming from the self-reported data by the companies. Uh, is there any way to validate uh, the transparency and reliability? Uh, here, you know, data can be some, uh, some uh, can play some roles in here. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Soyon. And I think it's it's really interesting to hear those questions around how do you know what is green, and then how do you know if uh, how do investors in particular know if green is profitable? I know you've done some wider research around that as well. We weren't able to get to uh, today, but to continue that theme, how do we know what's green, and and how do we know how do investors uh, know if green is profitable? Let me perhaps turn from the, the academic perspective uh, to a perspective of someone who's really worked uh, very closely on the ground. Uh, Emmanuel Herbosa, uh, you're the president and CEO of the Development Bank of the Philippines. And in this capacity, uh, you've overseen the bank's initiatives around sustainability and uh, green finance. So let me turn over to you uh, to share your experiences from the Philippines. Good afternoon to my dis distinguished colleagues. I, I have to stand up because I, I can't think without on my feet. It is a great honor to join in this session on greening the financial system. We are grateful for this opportunity to share with you the Philippines experience in 
greening the financial system as initiated by the Central Bank of the Philippines and with the catalytic role of the Development Bank of the Philippines in influencing investments towards sustainable finance. For more than seven decades, DBP has firmly supported the Philippine national government's developmental trusts with its unswerving efforts to promote growth in the strategic sectors of infrastructure and logistics, environmental responsibility and preservation, social services and community development, and micro, small, and medium enterprises. The hardest hit by the lockdown due to the pandemic. As a developmental bank, DBP serves as a catalyst for balanced, sustainable, and inclusive growth. Our operations and lending activities answer the call to action of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs to end poverty, promote inclusiveness, build peaceful societies, and protect the planet. We also align our objectives with the Philippine Development Plan 2017 to 2022 which aims to enhance the social fabric supported by the foundations of peace and security, strategic infrastructure development, safe and resilient communities, and ecological integrity or clean and healthy environment. Part of our environmental sustainability initiatives is to set an example to all stakeholders in adopting, promoting, and implementing environmentally sound practices and strategies in 1997, DBP crafted its environmental policy statement, which stipulated the bank's commitment to environmental protection. DBP operationalized its environmental management system in 2002, earning for the bank the distinction of being the first Philippine bank to be ISO certified. That is 14001. In September 2019, DBP became one of 132 founding signatories of the United Nations Environment Program Principles for Responsible Banking. We stand shoulder to shoulder with a coalition of now 240 banks from 69 countries committed to strategically align their businesses with the SDGs and the Paris Agreement. More recently, on April 29, 2020, the Central Bank of the Philippines issued Circular Number 1085 on Sustainable Finance Framework, mandating all financial institutions to embed sustainability principles, including environmental and social risk areas in their corporate governance framework, risk management systems, and strategic objectives. With this policy, the central bank recognizes the critical role of the financial industry in pursuing sustainable and resilient growth by enabling environmentally and socially responsible business decisions consistent with the Philippine Development Plan. Circular 1085 on sustainable finance framework recognizes the threat posed by climate change and other environmental and social risks to the country's financial stability due to their impacts on the operations and financial interests of banks. Financial institutions are given three years to fully comply with the requirements of Circular 1085, including the consideration of sustainability implications. This in the context of the overall decision-making process alongside and within traditional financial analysis. Implementation of the circular across the industry is expected to increase investments in climate financing and green projects. In response to our circular 1085 and the UN EP's principles for responsible banking, the DBP Board of Directors approved the bank's sustainability strategy and transition plan, which provides the platform and structure for deeper institutionalization of sustainability policies and procedures in DBP. Under the SSTP, DBP has committed a sustained increase in the bank's environmental portfolio with the objective of increasing positive environmental impact from its portfolio. Additionally, 
DBP's five-year strategic environmental plan lays down the framework for integrating environmental considerations in all aspects of its operations. The key issues tackled in the plan are energy efficiency measures, environmental guidelines, environmental project financing, environmental and social due diligence, and environmental competency. At DBP, we believe that small steps will eventually progress to major leaps. This means taking simple measures such as conservation of electricity, fuel, water, and paper, among others. On the home front, we strive to continually decrease resource consumption through such simple initiatives as a gradual phase out of old air conditioning units, as we shift to inverter technology, opting for LED lights, digital digitization of files, adoption of green procurement, implementation of paper light initiatives, and maximizing the use of IT resources, of course, including collaboration platforms. With the various energy efficiency measures implemented in the bank, most DBP offices have successfully fallen within the building energy efficiency index of 160 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. However, DBP's commitment to environmental protection goes beyond the impact of our internal initiatives on the environment. The breadth and depth of our mandate as a financial institution also places us in a pivotal position to significantly impact the environment through our investment and lending activities. As a country's premier development financial institution, DBP is strategically poised to influence its clients and other stakeholders to adopt sustainable business practices. On the lending side, environmental and social due diligence are embedded in the initial stages of loan processing to protect the bank's interest where environmental and social issues may give rise to credit, legal, or even reputational risks. We have a credit policy that mandates screening of projects by categorizing their environmental risk, identify possible impacts of natural and climate hazards on the projects, appraise the project's environmental and social impacts, and pin down performance indicators to measure achievement of environmental and socioeconomic targets. DBP's lending programs cut across different critical sectors and industries, such as transportation, logistics, energy, water, supply and sanitation, healthcare, education, social housing, among others. These lending programs are carefully designed to influence and channel development towards projects and sectors identified to generate significant environmental and social impacts. I'll mention to you a few. One is the DBP Water for Every Resident Program, or acronym WATER, which supports SDG6, ensuring access to clean water and sanitation for all. DBP Water is our umbrella program for supporting water supply projects, and its objective is aligned with the Philippine Water Supply Sector Roadmap, which aims, among others, to ensure adequate long-term availability of and accessibility to potable water. As we all know, as National Geographic says, at any given time, only 1% of the world's water is potable. We also rely with the government in its call for reduced greenhouse gas efficiencies through energy sustainability. This is the very essence of DBP's Energy Efficiency Savings or acronym E2SAVE financing program. The E2SAVE program was designed to provide credit assistance to public and private institutions, including energy service companies in improving their productivity by harnessing available new technologies in the market for their energy efficiency projects. E2SAVE allows loan repayment based on electricity savings to make investment affordable to end users. 
while contributing to efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. One of the bank's financing initiatives on energy sustainability directly addresses the growing demand for new power sources fueled largely by our expanding national economy. In 2021, just last year, DBP granted a 750 million peso revolving credit line to Amber Kinetics Philippines Inc. for the manufacture and export of cost-effective and sustainable energy storage systems for power generation activities of renewable energy companies. I think the science here is uh, the centrifugal force of kinetic energy, and we're hoping that this will be a viable option to lithium-powered batteries. To address the investment requirement also in the solid and Asardus Waste Management Sector, DBP created uh, its SWEEP financing program, Sustainable Waste Management for Enhanced and en Environmental Protection. This program covers the entire gamut of the solid and hazardous waste management from waste generation, collection, transportation, storage, sorting, processing, recycling, treatment, up to final disposal of waste. The program caters to public institutions such as local government units, the provinces and the cities, and government owned and controlled corporations, as well as private companies such as sanitary landfill operators, solid waste service providers, registered hazardous waste treaters and transporters, and waste to energy developers. These three programs are only some of several of what we have in our portfolio. Apart from these initiatives, DBP also made significant investment towards environmental protection, such as watershed. One such investment is the establishment of an indigenous seed source center in Mount Apo Natural Park in the Southern Philippines. The seed center shall serve as a storage facility of endemic species from the forest of Mount Apo and other neighboring forests in Mindanao for seed banking and propagation. This project not only enhances the capacities of rural communities or the IPs, indigenous people, in preserving the forest landscapes, protecting the watersheds, but also provides them with livelihood opportunities. To further solidify DBP's commitment towards environmental protection, DBP has not only pledged to annually increase its financing to environmental projects, it has also made a policy not to finance coal-fired power plants. Although this comes at a price, it stands out, it sends out an, an equivocal message that the bank takes very seriously its advocacy for environmental sustainability and climate action. In the area of climate change, however, the Philippines contributes less than 1% of the global carbon emission, yet it bears the brunt of climate impacts. The Global Climate Risk Index reported that between 2000 and 2019, the Philippines ranked as the fourth most vulnerable country in accumulated and long-term exposure to extreme weather events such as typhoons, of which we have 22 every year. According to the Philippines Department of Finance, the country is expected to incur an annual loss of roughly $3.6 billion in both public and private assets due to extreme weather events. Moreover, this, there is a 40% chance that the country might experience losses amounting to around $18.9 billion and a 20% chance in the next 50 years of incurring $30.5 billion in losses. This underscores the importance of pursuing a development pathway that would allow communities to build resilience, adopt better technologies to move away from fossil fuel driven practices and increase the capacity of frontline communities to plan and implement their very own climate actions. For its part, DBP pushes for rural electrification and renewable energy to achieve further development in the countryside. 
Along this line, the bank makes available long-term financing to support energy projects, not only for large industries, but more so for SMEs. The bank does this through the DBP FUSED program, acronym for Financing Utilities for Sustainable Energy Development, which was designed to fund utility scale energy generation using renewable energy such as biomass, geothermal, solar, hydro, ocean, wind, and other emerging technologies and power distribution projects. It provides long-term financing of up to 15 years inclusive of a five years grace period on principle. To further support renewable energy development, DBP crafted the Solar Merchant Power Plant SMPP financing program to encourage investment in utility scale solar that will sell, that will sell energy pr produced in the spot market. In closing, let me underscore that climate financing is a priority undertaking of DBP as aligned with the country's low carbon and resilient climate change actions. We believe that integration of environmental, social, and governance issues is a way to generate new business from sustainable investment opportunities, as well as a financial risk management technique DBP continues to craft sustainable programs and implement climate actions to build possibilities towards meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. It is an opportune time for DBP to be here present for the first time with the GCF, and we really look forward to as much assistance that we have to complement our lending portfolio and strategies. Thank you to all, have a pleasant afternoon. Thank you very much, Emmanuel, for sharing that experience from the Philippines. We know, as you've said, that Philippines is an intensely climate vulnerable uh, country. Uh, and it's great to hear from you some of those initiatives that the bank is taking, uh, both on the resilience side through your programs, but actually also on, on the net zero uh, energy uh, transmission uh, transition, despite actually the contribution of, of Philippines being uh, relatively little in the global picture. It's also very interesting, I think, to hear uh, the way Development Bank of Philippines has actually uh, sort of priced or taken into account some of those risks to your portfolio. And we'll be coming back to that theme a little bit uh, uh, later in our presentation. Uh, I also, uh, I can't help but love at the end, the picture of the kids, because that's why we're here. And that's why we're worried about climate change. So, so thank you for bringing us uh, to, to the real people on the ground on that. And actually to stay on that theme, uh, let us go to our next speaker, uh, Vinef, who's the CEO of the Bank of the Cook Islands. And I think as we were preparing for this session, uh, you're actually uh, teasing us, wetting our appetite uh, with some news of some uh, exciting products and initiatives that Bank of Cook Islands has taken in, in your island home. So please over to you to, to let us know more about that. Thank you very much, Selena. I'm also going to stand, um, not because I think on my feet, but because it makes a better photo shoot when my colleagues take a photo of me being here. Kia ora ana tato katoto. My name is Vaini Arioka, CEO for Bank of the Cook Islands. Greetings to our esteemed um, audience and my esteemed panel. Thank you for giving me five minutes of your time this afternoon. If I may start, um, raising private sector and household ambitions for climate resilience. Um, this is a call from our private sector, a recent workshop held two weeks ago, um, and the challenge was given to the, the participants and the stakeholders gathered um, to help them raise their ambitions for climate resilience. Um, I will also mention that BCI, we have the express support from our national designated authority under our green climate, um, under green climate fund to pursue accreditation as a direct access entity. So we've embarked on that process and we still have a ways to go. Um, as a 20 year old organization with a development bank history, we're not as evolved and um, embedded in um, some of our uh, 
financing practices as um, my elder colleague here, um, the Development Bank of the Philippines, but we certainly aspire to be more of a catalyst of climate finance in the Cook Islands. Um, so why has Bank of the Cook Islands been um, endorsed by our national designated authority to become a direct access entity? As one of the only three banks in the Cook Islands, uh, retail banks that is, alongside um, two of our international corporate retail banks, um, we the purpose is so we can bring a full suite access of financing instruments to the Cook Islands. Our only other direct access um, entity um, is accredited uh, for two instruments, um, project management and grants, while BCI, um, our aspiration is to bring the instrument of on lending and or blending. So how will this help our private sector in accessing climate finance in the Cook Islands? Well, essentially, um, it's stated right there through the Paris Agreement um, that we should make finance flows consistent with a pathway towards low greenhouse uh, gas emissions and climate resilient development. We, um, I, we are quite excited to, uh, with regards to the private sector facility and especially its um, reviews that have um, been undertaken. Um, but most especially, we're excited with the um, credit lines um, to local financial institutions, as well as the last one, can't quite see it there, um, but establishing green banks or establishing green finance instruments um, into our private sector. Our why, um, just like my esteemed colleague um, mentioned, our children, our future generation, uh, BCI too seeks to do well by our stakeholders um, by doing good in the communities that we serve. Um, and BCI is deeply ingrained in our in the activities and the activities of our wider Cook Islands communities of the fifteen islands, thirteen that we are um, present on. Um, and so with that, um, we, it is imperative um, that we bring our partners together um, to all our island communities and our ongoing and long-term provision of green finance to the communities that we serve. I also wanted to make mention another reason of our why. We recently, as a country, developed our National Sustainable development agenda. Um, it's a 100-year plan. An empowered, innovative, and environmentally conscious people who are grounded in our culture and languages with the highest quality of well-being. Um, one of the goals within the uh, development agenda is to protect our pristine environment. Our people want to see um, um, less pressure on our natural environment and carrying capacities, reduce development, um, an environment that is rich in biodiversity and where our future generations can be proud. So this is where we draw our inspiration and our aspirations from. Um, and I also wanted to mention recognition of our cultural rights and reinforce cultural values conducive to our well-being and sustainable development. Each of the 15 islands um, and the 13 islands that we operate on, they each have their own community values um, and uh, practices uh, that when we as a uh, finance institution um, at, um, uh, operate in, uh, we, we must recognize those and um, operate uh, within the cultures, the norms and practices of each of those islands. So that transpires into how we bring finance and what type of finance we bring to each island as well. Our experience, um, I only wanted to mention two. Uh, in 2014, we, uh, through our self fund, uh, through our own uh, ge internally generated funding, um, financed grid connected investment um, in solar PV farms. 
when our utility provider opened up the opportunity, private sector were fast to mobilize. When private sector see an opportunity, they want to take advantage of that opportunity. So instead of going to market and raising funds, we realized this was an uh, immense opportunity um, to go in and um, fund the private sector in this initiative. Um, another one that I wanted to make mention of is um, our Aotearoa Islands resilience. Um, that is part and parcel of everything we do um, with regards to our loan portfolio. We've got about 13% of our loan portfolio out in the outer islands, um, helping them uh, stay resilient to climate change and uh, the challenges of actually living on remote atolls. Uh, we do have an EDA in the pipeline, and this is being developed with our national, uh, sorry, yeah, with our NDA, um, as well as um, our other uh, direct access entity in the Cook Islands. Um, so our collaborative efforts we, is, um, is, is important to us to bring a total financing package. Um, so we look forward to this enhanced direct access um, application or project. Um, to be approved in the coming year. We also have a concept note that was developed by our uh, private sector that we wish to take on board and also follow through and bring to, um, bring to reality as well. So GCF, this is where I get a little bit cheeky, your opportunity um, to catalyze private climate finance in a country-driven manner to meet developing countries' needs. Direct, simple, and swift. Um, the Pacific Islands, not just the Cook Islands, um, we have just economies of scale. We understand that every, every financing mechanism uh, to us does come with high transaction costs, uh, but whatever financing mechanisms are brought into the Pacific needs to be direct to the end beneficiaries. It needs to be simple. Um, spoken about earlier was the uh, blended finance structure where some foreign exchange risk was taken on in the in the ecosystem of the participants within the blended finance structure and that was music to my ears uh, because in the in the Pacific you'll know that we have quite um, uh, unique currencies. They aren't the strong currencies of the of the US um, and, and co. So whatever solutions are brought in, if we can uh, simplify and um, simplify those structures, it, it allows for more direct um, access to our benefit to our beneficiaries, our customers and our communities. It also needs to be swift and timely. Um, I spoke about earlier with regards to once private sector in the island see an opportunity, they want to mobilize and take advantage of the opportunities that um, are present. So we need a financing mechanism that, um, that can be mobilized swiftly to those private sectors um, and 12 to 18 to 24 months is not a timeline uh, that they generally like. Um, in closing, the person I'm here in this photo with is our Prime Minister, Mark Brown, who opened um, at the opening of the um, country programming forum earlier um, on Tuesday. Um, it's a bit of a challenge with um, itineraries or, or programming. He was supposed to open at the opening of this uh, of, of this conference earlier this morning, and he wasn't given that opportunity. So I have now been given the opportunity, if I can, um, just to take a little bit of um, an inspiration out of his out of his speech from this morning to leave with the room today. Um, so this is from our Prime Minister of the Cook Islands, the Honourable Mark Brown. In 2019, I asked the following, can the private sector, institutional investors and other corporations or corporates, finance, climate change mitigation and adaptation activities in small isolated economies such as in my country and across the Pacific? He, he acknowledges that the viability of project investments remains uncertain. However, in the end, um, he does ask, 
that we require smart minds to come up with innovative ways to draw investment into economies such as ours, not just the low hanging renewable energy fruit, but also investment in the more challenging adaptation areas. We now need innovation, we need action, we seek partners, and more than ever, we need collaboration between partners. Thank you very much, Vine. Th thanks for passing on uh, that message uh, from your Prime Minister, the Honourable Mark Brown. He was a fantastic speaker at the outset of the Global Programming uh, Conference. And we don't mind you being a little bit uh, cheeky there. You can call it cheeky or you could call it a call for action, which is what uh, we're all here for and, and about. And I think it was interesting to hear from both yourself and actually from Emmanuel uh, that focus actually on the end beneficiaries, uh, on working with your local private sector on working with uh, MSMEs. And I think this is uh, one of the power actually of one of the powers of, of the direct access mode and also of GCF's collaboration uh, with uh, entities such as uh, national weather development or, or retail banks that we can actually make that transition down from the international level of finance to you, to institutions who know your communities, know your markets, know what products are needed and actually see that finance reach the ground. So that's fantastic. Now, Go, to go to our next speaker, I'm going to pick up a theme that's actually run through a couple of the presentations from Soyons and Emmanuel's, uh, which is more about how lenders can actually understand uh, what impacts, what risk climate change is going to bring uh, into, their, into their portfolios of lending and investments. And Dr. Park, you're a member of the International Sustainability Standards uh, Board from the IF, IFRS Foundation, tongue twister there. Now, uh, many may not be familiar uh, with uh, your work on climate disclosures and reporting, but it's certainly very relevant uh, to the topic we have here today. So over to you to uh, tell us a little bit more about that and how that is uh, likely to support the green uh, finance transition. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I am very honored to make a presentation for this wonderful uh, global conference today. Uh, this is Taeyang Peck, uh, one of the uh, 14 uh, uh, board members of International Sustainability Standard Board on the IFRS Foundation. Uh, there are three members representing Asia and Oceania region right now. Uh, let me move on. So, as you might know that uh, the ISSB was established by a COP26 announcement uh, last year. And uh, our foundation consolidated uh, existing CDSB, Climate Disclosure Standard Board, and Value Reporting Foundation. Value Reporting Foundation is a merged organization uh, by IR. Uh, in, uh, integrated reporting framework and, or IRIC and SASB. And we published two, uh, published two exposure drafts of general disclosure requirement and climate, uh, climate disclosure. Actually, it's not prototype, it's actually an old one. I forgot to change it. It was prototype, now it is exposure draft right now. And the foundation has a uh, monitoring board and uh, foundation trustees. And on the trustees, we have two uh, boards. One is accounting board, uh, international accounting standard board, making uh, a global accounting standard, the old one. And the new one is ISSB. So we are sister board right now. So, the accounting side, International Accounting Standard Board makes a standard for financial statement, but our board make a sustainability disclosure standard. But the common features of, the, uh, of these two board is we are making standard for in investors and capital market rather than other uh, stakeholders. We, I, 
we have primary users of invested. You might have, we have a secondary users, but usually you don't mention <laughs> secondary users, but we do have secondary users for sure. So the two uh, disclosures send that uh, uh, announced is uh, G1 and G2 and Ah, sorry, S1 and S2. S1 is general requirement and S2 is climate related uh, disclosure standard. And the, the common architecture is based on uh, TCFD structure. So we have uh, four pillars or four uh, core elements, governance, strategy, risk management, and metrics and targets. So S1 has a general requirement standard. And the second one, S2, is climate-related uh, disclosure center. So it is one of the uh, industry-based requirement. We will uh, create follow-up industry-based, uh, I'm sorry, CMIC, CMIC, uh, CMATIC requirement is uh, climate-related uh, standard. And we will have additional uh, thematic uh, uh, requirement by topic. But we have some industry based requirement as additional one, like S2, using SASB uh, uh, con uh, contents. So let me briefly uh, introduce the first uh, standard, general requirement. So basically, it is covering all uh, sustainability uh, risk and opportunities. So it's really one for all standard. And uh, it has a uh, basic requirement as well, like, uh, you know, where to uh, put those disclosure and when and to disclose the standard and so on. But basically it has a uh, four pillar as I explained. I have more slide than needed, so mm -hmm. I will move on quickly. So basically, uh, what we are trying to uh, ask is significant sustainability ladies and opportunity information, which will impact the company financially. So we have financial maturity approach. So S1 is general requirement and S2 is a climate related. And we will have more uh, standard coming up. We haven't decided what and when yet. And so by now, we don't have any other specific standards. So if you wanna use S1, you couldn't use SASB and other existing standard as well. So there are key features of our approach basically uh, we want to have some connection between financial statement and sustainability report. So we have integrated uh, reporting approach. And also we want to ask the financial statement and sustainability disclosure will be published at the same time. And also we want to have uh, those information, sustainability uh, sustainability related information as part of financial, big financial reports. But we haven't decided, we are not going to specify where to put because uh, ju different jurisdiction will decide a specific place. Uh, typically, you can think of a management commentary or MDNA, depending on country, they have a slight different names. Uh, let me talk about talk about the second standard we have, climate exposure rep. So it is based on TCFD framework. We made uh, some changes, but most of them are very similar to TCFD uh, recommendation. So, and also it has in appendix SASB standard for uh, different industry as well. So basically it requires information about physical risk, transition risk, and climate related opportunities as well. And as I mentioned in the appendix, we have uh, uh, industry specific additional requirement in terms of metric. So all came from uh, the SASB 
contents. So we have uh, a six state industry. And maybe I can skip this. So this uh, slide shows how this standard is related to two existing standard, uh, TCFD and CSP standard. And as you know, well, you know, we merged CSP and TCFD in our organization. So uh, as key features, uh, we ask uh, emission uh, uh, result and also targets and also use of carbon offset for transition planning. And also we will ask about uh, resilience of business strategy. And the key feature is that we are asking scope one and one to and three emission as well. So that is, that is a little bit uh, high standard we are asking. So we have uh, seven uh, cross industry metrics in S2. Uh, greenhouse gas emission or uh, absolute uh, intensity in all three scopes, scopes. And also we are asking transition risk, fiscal risk, climate related opportunities, and also capital deployment decisions, and also internal carbon prices, and also any management uh, compensation based on uh, climate related uh, program or performance. And since many of you are from finance and institution, you know, I want to add this finance emission issues. It is only for finance institutions. Finance institutions are users of those sustainability report information as well as preparer. So for the finance institution, we have additional requirement of finance emission. And it is something new, which it wasn't uh, there in SASB. So in this finance emission for, for example, for commercial banks and insurance, they are, have to report uh, the GHG emission in three scope by asset classes and so on. I will skip all this. And uh, we have a slight different uh, requirement for asset management cost of activity. So there's no, uh, uh, as it's not by, uh, uh, industry or not by asset uh, classes. And also we have uh, additional uh, requirement for investment banking and brokerage as well. And since we had uh, uh, common letters uh, uh, received until uh, uh, last month, right? So uh, this is a summary of the matters raised in common letters and also in our rich, rich activity. So there are five areas uh, where the concerns were raised. First one is scope of the proposal and data consideration in the breakdown and the complexity and case for increased flexibility. And all these uh, uh, comments letters are open for public. And also the summary of the comment letters are uh, disclosed this, this uh, several days ago, because we are going to have a board meeting uh, next week in Frankfurt. So uh, this board meeting uh, papers are published in, in our website. So you can see all these things. And also our board meeting will be uh, broadcasted in real time and the recorded uh, meeting can be uh, seen by anybody at any time. Uh, so if you have any other concern on S1 and S2, you can tell me, even though comment period, comment letter period is closed, but still, you know, we can take your opinion in outreach activity like this one. So, and also one thing we better know is uh, next week, there are two interesting, uh, Topics. One is finance or facility emission I just mentioned. And the second one is uh, scalability mechanism for uh, small and medium corporation and uh, emerging economies. So since uh, Soyoung mentioned that issue, I will 
uh, talk about it uh, if I have time and later, point of time. So it's quite open to give your opinion to us. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Park. And I think what's interesting here moving through the conversation is, of course, to, to green the financial system, we do need investments and we need to increase that access to capital markets as well for investments. But we also need tools and, and methodologies like the ones uh, you've described to actually enable uh, the right decision making uh, to happen. And I think both you and Soyong have touched on some of the challenges around how we also get some more consistency in those methodologies, both around understanding uh, what the climate risks are, the physical risks and the transition risks, but also consistency around the methodologies for, for measuring action. And it's going to be very interesting, I think, to see uh, how some of that work on climate disclosures is actually taken up uh, by uh, organizations in the finance landscape. So that is by, by the lenders, uh, investors and others. And uh, on that note, uh, we turn to Ruth uh, from UNEP. I know you're not here doing your day job uh, today, but you are here to talk about the UNEP FI initiative on the Net Zero Banking Alliance, uh, which is a very ambitious uh, initiative, again, launched at COP26 uh, in Glasgow last year. So over to you to uh, tell us a bit more about this and, uh, and UNEP's role in that. Thank you very much, Selena, and uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, bringing this topic to the agenda. We think it's interesting. It's a call for action uh, as well, and uh, I'm very humbled and happy to be here. So thank you very much. And uh, my colleagues have made a, a great job. I'll try to do it as well. So we all know that um, climate change is one of the greatest challenge of our times. And uh, as you correctly mentioned at COP26, what we call the GFANS, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, umbrella amassed 130 trillion of commitments across the finance industry to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. The first colleague that actually made her intervention, she mentioned that the money is there, but we need it needs to be mobilized. I will add the commitment is there, but it needs to be supported to deliver. And that's why I think one of the reasons we are here is in how we can best support these commitments and the members that have actually made the pledge to deliver uh, in the best possible way. Um, using correct standards and taxonomies, but also being supported because the challenge is, is very big. And we'll talk a little bit about the commitments and the challenges. So UNEP, through the UNEP Finance Initiative called UNEP-FI, actually uh, convenes three of the alliances that were launched in, uh, the, in through the GFANS umbrella the Net Zero Banking Alliance, the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, and the Net Zero Insurance Alliance. And uh, you have many sectoral guidance from different, actually, uh, types of industry because the characteristics of each of the industries are actually very different. And I will talk today a little bit more about the, the Net Zero Banking Alliance and uh, what does it mean to be a member of the Net Zero Banking Alliance? It means that a member bank commits to become, to have net zero emissions, so net zero emissions by 2050. And this has to be applicable to the investment and lending portfolios. And this is a, 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 hu a huge challenge. But what we can see is that there is a, a very strong coalition of banks that are providing this signal to policymakers. We have, as of today, 115 members in the Alliance of Commercial Banks, and this represents 67 trillion of assets and represents 43% of global banking assets. It's a major uh, commitment uh, within the financial system. And if we can actually support specifically banks in developing countries that have actually joined the alliance to deliver on their commitments, I think we're going to inf influence not port project by project, but overall portfolios to make the change. And I think we heard, I don't know, Selina, if you're here, but in the previous uh, presentation, I think the colleague from the Deutsche Bank uh, said something that actually called my attention. He said that 
it's it's very important to support the portfolio and not only project by project and it has to be done by colleagues who know what they're talking about so we need partnerships with the colleagues in the in banks that are going to this struggle to support other banks as well so just to to continue and to give you some uh, information when the alliance was launched we had 10 of the largest banks in Europe, 10 of the largest banks, all of the largest banks in North America joining the alliance, seven of the seven, seven of the 10 largest banks in Latin America, four of the 10 largest banks in Asia, and three of the largest banks in Africa. But what we aim for is to reach to the Cook Islands banks and to the other banks who deliver to their communities and to see how this journey of deep decarbonization can actually help them to achieve their own ambitions and goals to support uh, this, this deep decarbonization climate uh, challenge. So just to continue, what does it mean if a bank joins as a member? What is this commitment to become net zero? How does it translate in reality? And I'll just give a, a, a glimpse of the main points because there is more detailed guidance that you can all access in the, in the website of UNEPFI. You just click UNEPFI Net Zero Banking Alliance and a lot of information is there. So our, all Alliance members have committed to achieve net zero emissions in their lending and investment portfolios by 2050. What does it mean that they have to align with net zero pathways? They have 18 months to set intermediate targets and long-term targets. So targets for to, to, watch, to uh, what is gonna be the pathway in 2030, and then what would be the targets every five years until you reach 2050. We heard in, in the previous uh, discussion, it, it doesn't mean that a bank joins the Alliance and tomorrow it's green, it's impossible. It takes a, a long time and it takes a process and it has to be done properly. And uh, the bank has to, it's very, very complex. Banks have subsidiaries, even in Cook Islands, you have many, many banks and you have to deploy this in many um, different uh, types of uh, situation and different types of clients. So it's a, a complex process. We acknowledge that. And, uh, and but, but I think it's a very important commitment. And I think probably one of the most outstanding, in, in my view, outcomes of, of the, the, the copies is to have the financial sector making such a commitment. Uh, they have already uh, convened the principles for the, the responsible banking. We have more membership there, almost uh, 300, 300 banks, but here is, is a, a step up in, in, in ambition. So the banks, uh, they, they will put their far targets in 2030. They will focus on their priority sectors and then uh, in the first 18 months, and then they can actually focus on all the sectors. And when we begin to talk about sectors and high emitting sectors in the portfolio, we hit the problem of the hard to abate sectors. Yeah, and I'm gonna, can I go back afterwards? I can go up and so these are the nine priority sectors that uh, are part of the Alliance. And you will see that we have coal, oil and gas, aluminum, cement, iron and steel. These are very hard to abate sectors, but I think the position is that this is the, the, the situation of the market today. And there is, while we do not support at all the expansion of any of these sectors, especially the oil and gas sector or the coal sector, the, the Bank of Philippines has de-invested themselves from coal fire plants. It's too much to ask for a immediate deinvestment. This is going to cause actually a shock in the market. And there is no need to do that immediately. But there is a need to work on that and to establish targets that are achievable. So slowly this can be properly done and it will have to be done. And uh, so so this is the the, the challenge to, to do. It doesn't mean that all the banks are actually investing in coal and oil gas, especially in Latin America, a lot of banks where actually their priority most immediately emitting sector is the agriculture sector because of the, the emissions that come from that sector. So just to, to come back to the commitment, so establishing targets, intermediate targets, focusing on the high emitting sectors first, then focusing in all the sectors, 
in 36 months, and then uh, committing to publish absolute emissions and emissions intensity. And this comes to the nitty gritty that my colleague before explained, scope one emission, scope two emission, scope three emission, in line with the best practices within a year of setting the targets. So, and this close progress against a broad, board, broad level reviewed a board level reviewed transition strategy, setting out proposed actions and climate related sectoral policies. And then I take a very robust approach to the role of offsets in transition plans. So offset is the last measure where after all other measures have been taken into account, if there is any residual emission that needs to be um, abated uh, to, to become net zero, you, you can use offset but it's not the preferred, of course, option. So I, you know, we can go very much into the detail of this, but I think it, this is not the point. Uh, what I would like to, to emphasize is that this uh, is supported by guidelines and guidance to support this transition. So we have four guidance uh, guidelines within this document that you see on the right side. And these guidance uh, are there, but they are not yet sufficient. They're just guidance documents. And there is a need to, to accompany many banks in this transition. So what it, it has been very recent, the, the COP has been last year. So we don't have a lot of uh, things yet to report, but we are already seeing what has happened in the ground. Banks are beginning to set their first uh, targets, emission reduction targets, and they are developing now their plans to meet the, the Alliance commitments. And what we have been he hearing is that it really requires a, full, a, a different mindset within the corporation, within all levels of staff to reach uh, this transition. The net zero transition is, is much uh, more challenge for, for banks in developing countries. There are gaps in regulatory framework. We heard throughout the, the sessions is that, what does it mean if the country has positioned it's actually net zero uh, <laughs> commitment to 2060 or 27? Does the bank continue with 2050? And uh, the Deutsche Bank said, yes, we're one bank and we will keep the 2050 target, which is not gonna, it's gonna be more advanced than the country target. So. The country will reach net zero by 2070 with a with a, a pathway, maybe through green hydrogen, and their milestones will be different than the milestones of the bank. And the bank support that sector. How we're gonna support that? And and that is some, there are questions that will come up, and we'll have to respond and adjust. But I think it's interesting, and it begins to see how the financial sector is linked to a, an enabled regulatory framework, it's, it's very important. They are exposed to higher financial risks and the market conditions are much more difficult and to compete in a, a level playing field. What we don't want is actually a de-invest and then an invest but a bank that is actually not member of the alliance. This is, this is why the regulatory uh, system and, and framework needs to be aligned to avoid that kind of transferring of uh, finance. So there is not finance for things that in the future won't be sustainable anymore. It is essential to support the banks, we believe in developing countries, to avoid also a disparity within financial institutions. So we see the Deutsche Bank and MUFCA with a, a very robust team uh, and we see other banks that won't have that capacity. Can we within UNAB, GCF, JEF, other donors actually support these banks that don't have this muscle to do this transition at the portfolio level. In addition, there will be, uh, we see that uh, the criteria applied to the transition would benefit standardization. We, we heard about taxonomies and classification and there is a lot of work that needs to be done. So we all understand what does it mean to become net zero what are the milestones? How to? What are the targets that we said? What are the pathways that are accepted? Should we focus on which type of uh, scenarios and pathways? And now uh, there is a lot of discussion on that. And what we don't want is to be prescriptive in terms of the scenarios. We believe that the banks should choose their own scenarios, but it has to be science-based targets. It has to be based on the best available science. And um, just a. Uh, uh, maybe 
two final slides. The progress today, we see that uh, the banks are beginning to define their strategies and commitments, but overall I'm talking not only the developing uh, country banks and what we see as uh, we're doing some surveys to see you know, what is coming from the ground. And what we see is that the, they report back to us that there, there is a need to a massive transformation into their internal operations, a shift into their commercial strategies. And that's difficult because the product lines and accompany the clients will, will be very difficult. I heard, uh, I think in the previous session, saying no to a, an investment is a very complicated issue from the, stand, from the standpoint of climate action. So out of the five banks that we interviewed, two in developed countries and three in developing countries, some common areas that they said that they will need further support in this journey is in their operational transition, is translate their targets into a roadmap and then implement the roadmap within the bank. Uh, commercial strategies, that's very complex. How they are gonna now change their whole commercial strategies in the priority sectors, consistent with the climate goals and the science-based targets and how to define a taxonomy for measuring system to track the changes towards climate goals. We heard that this becomes difficult when it's not very clear cut what some of the transactions that the banks actually do. So just to finalize, can we succeed? Because we launched the, 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 the call for action, members are there, there is a lot of uh, assets that will become net zero, we hope. I think we can succeed, but uh, we need support. We need to strengthen and accelerate the transition and the, on the emissions uh, portfolio, especially in developing countries. I think we need to transform the markets where they operate. So it's, it's a jo joint journey. So we need to support also the countries to enable that process to happen and the finance and the private sector finance to be mobilized. And uh, I think we need more members in the in the net zero banking alliance, uh, because I think we think that, you know, the more banks we have, the more we will be able to cover all the 130 million assets that need to be mobilized to, to actually act on this uh, uh, challenging, but inspiring, I think, uh, commitment. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Ruth, uh, for that insight into, again, a hugely ambitious initiative. There's a comment in the chat, the climate change war uh, needs to start going beyond commitments to implementation and enforceability. I think we all understand that while commitments are hard to make, uh, it's actually implementing them. That's the, uh, that's the iceberg uh, beneath the water. Uh, and I like the call there saying, of course, we can succeed by putting our minds together. Um, it's a it's an interesting uh, call there, uh, looking both at sort of what's required to actually support the the equitable approach to this. It's not a question of obviously turning the flow of money off uh, overnight or greening banks overnight, but actually being able to move together on the the transition in those systems and transition in investments that will actually allow the economy uh, and investment to sort of shift together on that pathway on greening the financial system. So. Thank you very much to all our panelists. It's been a hugely, again, uh, diverse set of perspectives there on greening uh, the financial system, um, all the way from looking at how finance is being greened at a very local level uh, in the Philippines and in the Cook Islands, uh, to then shifting really trillions of dollars of lending and investment uh, through the global banking system. And that brings us uh, to, we've only actually got about 10 minutes left uh, for our questions. I've got a couple on the chat. Uh, so I'm going to throw these uh, the panel's way and see who'd like to take uh, some of these. Uh, the first one, which has been up for some time, uh, what are the best practices in terms of effective collaboration with central banks in mobilizing climate finance and any regulatory incentives? Uh, Emmanuel or, or Vaine, I don't know if you'd like to have a first uh, attempt at that one from the... Uh, what are the best practices in terms of effective collaboration with central banks in mobilizing climate finance? I think uh, Emmanuel is prepared uh, with his courage to have a go at this one. So over to you, Emmanuel. Well, I have to say we have to be obedient to, the, to our regulators. We, had, we don't have any choice. But uh, we do have um, an open door to discussing incentives with them. Uh, and uh, our central bank has been very encouraging 
uh, supporting us in our development trusts. We just have to clear this with them. The regulators have a, a, a big say and uh, on how we determine policies. So uh, I would say that uh, nothing really specific except that you have always have open, open channels to discuss freely how you see uh, your way in transforming uh, the landscape, making it more green by a more responsive and relevant uh, financing program. And I guess that's the reason why uh, I, I, I uh, tried to describe to you our top three. And um, uh, if uh, it's any, any proof of concept, we actually grew much faster during the time of COVID. We actually grew like 40%. I like to always say that uh, the uh, government financial institutions, and we have our, our sister uh, bank here, Land Bank of the Philippines, really did a lot of the uh, heavy weight lifting because at the time when uh, uh, there's a really much larger, higher risk, the private sector banks usually are very, very shy about uh, lending because they've got, they're more risk averse. So with a lot of support from the central bank, we were able to grow our portfolio tremendously. And I'd like to think that we're able to help our MSMEs in particular hurdle the, uh, the effect of the lockdown due to the pandemic. But I think there's also another clarion call because we face an environment of high interest rates. And as far as the Philippines is concerned, we have to defend the foreign exchange. Now, the question here for the central bankers is, who do you defend? What do you defend? Is it the foreign exchange or is it the interest rates? And uh, speaking from the development uh, side, I would be more concerned about the interest rate because that affects everybody more, so, more, more, more than the foreign exchange uh, deterioration. Well, uh, I, I hope in a, in a roundabout way, I'm able to answer that question. I think it's always an open dialogue and for us to really be confident with our solutions to how we can help the economy weather all of the systemic risks that we have right now and the many more that will come this coming years. Thank you. If Thank I'm, you very much. Go ahead, Vani. Yeah, but if I might add, um, maybe a practice or an approach could also be the proponents of, or propo being a proponent of the net zero banking, as well as the principles of responsible banking, because a lot of central banks and certainly prudential regulators um, look for um, these principles and you know these reporting standards um, as well. Great. Thanks to both of you for that. And I think very interesting to get those reflections, obviously, on the current, uh, I guess, broader macroeconomic environment as well, are both coming out of the COVID pandemic, but in, in light of the, the challenges globally we're currently facing, uh, which, of course, has in, uh, impacts on all of us and on the wider financial system. The next question, uh, which I'll throw to all of the panel for a different perspective, if you were submitting a proposal to GCF to green the financial sector, what activities would you prioritize? There is a list here, but it's very open-ended. So that's why I think it's an interesting question. And I'll start actually with Soyon and uh, and then move to, to Ruth and, and Dr. Park. And then uh, that might bring us almost to the end of our time. So we'll come back to you, Emmanuel and Vane, for a final word on this one. But it's a it's open mic on this one over to you Sayon. yeah if i don't have a big career change in myself it's gonna be a research proposal to gcf but uh uh, <laughs> uh i'm thinking about um these days the the risk assessment tool is very important but it is very last developed on surprisingly um and then also 
Yeah, so basically uh, why it's hard because, you know, climate risk is kind of like a different kinds, you know, like uh, we already mentioned about physical risk and transition risks. Uh, right now, uh, most of the uh, current methodology we have is very separated, you know, like we do have pretty well uh, developed level of, you know, risk assessment tool to test hurricane or, you know, like a precipitation or, you know, like a single or, you know, a, a few uh, risk factors uh, coming from climate change. But, you know, as you already experienced by now, um, you know, when it comes, you know, it actually comes in very intercorrelated way. So we have to have a, a integrated tool to test out um, those intercorrelated climate risk at the same time. And why, and then the and also what spits out out of this 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 uh, the, the the tool that we are developing uh, should directly help uh, you know financial decision maker to to make the decision of today. What it means is you know like uh, usually the metric that that is coming out is. Um, hardly science-based, but, you know, have like a still a lot of distance coming from like a science to the financial decision-making. Like, for example, so by having this probability, probability of risk, you know, how much uh, default rate would I have or how much, you know, interest rate that would be affected to my investment portfolio. So those type of, you know, like, um, you know, like a translation of the, the knowledge that is accessed by the tool uh, should be helpful for the financial decision maker. So yeah, it's gonna be a, a proposal to develop such tool to can actually help uh, financial decision makers. Thanks, Soyeon. Let's go to Ruth next. What a golden question. <laughs> Seems now I can say what I think the GCF could do in this space, I will. I think that if um, the GCF could actually take from the members of the alliance that are in developing countries, we have probably no regions and to put together a, a global program, not global because I think GCF doesn't do global multi-country program with uh, the countries where the banks in developing countries are that, me, that have actually joined the alliance and actually put a, a package to support their journey. So GCF2 is coming along and the intermediate targets will hit 2030 and help them with their, to actually have the tools that they need, the standards that they need, but also the commercial plans, the new product lines and link their annual disclosure system with your MRV system. So you can somehow, when they disclose the emissions that they have, actually done and if you put some support from your grant into actually helping them achieve them it's going to be probably the most cost effective way for your dollar because in two three five ten years from now if you can actually claim an, an attribute that the GCF has actually helped I don't know 30 banks that have joined the alliance to actually achieve their first high emitting sectors to actually uh, deliver you are blending your finance with the bank actually lending an investment portfolio and you can claim these emissions reductions. And I think it's it's probably one of the most effective ways of doing so. And by doing so, you help them to walk the talk in, in a way because that's, that's what we need is the implementation. And I think there is room to um, have peer-to-peer -peer exchanges and, and sharing of best practices and using the best available tools for them to achieve this change. Thanks very much, Ruth. Uh, Dr. Park, can I come to you next? Uh, working for a uh, standard uh, setting uh, organization right now, and also have been an uh, accounting professor for more than 30 years, I want to uh, uh, ask the, the fund require minimum uh, transparent disclosure of how the money was used and how, you know, the money has uh, effective result and so on. So it's related Ruth's comment, I guess. Uh, so in the case of Korea, when we had a financial crisis a long time ago, we got a big help from IMF and some other uh, global institution. And at that time we, got the money, but also we got 
very strong pressure to change our accounting uh, disclosure, asking to make it more transparent. So in a similar you know, uh, way, uh, I believe that wherever the money goes, there should be very transparent you know, reporting of how that money used. Uh, otherwise, I guess a lot of money can be wasted. And that is pretty bad for both sides, I guess. So that's my uh, big hope to have a more transparency for any, you know, uh, any uh, financial support from anybody. Great. Thank you so much. Vaina, so you're reaching for your mic, so I'll go to you next. <laughs> Um, my priority is definitely anything that will de-risk, anything that will lower that price point to my end customer. Um, so uh, bringing a proposal that will lower the price point will bring scale um, to our diseconomies of scale um, and ensuring that it delivers um, what our end consumers, our end borrowers, an impactful and meaningful um, program to them. If we can um, find that solution will definitely be greening the financial sector, not because we have to, but because we can, because we want to. Fantastic. And Emmanuel, I think the final word will be yours. We're pretty much uh, aligned to BCI. Um, our project focus would be water. Very important. Water uh, for, for irrigation, for better agricultural productivity, uh, for health, uh, for sanitation, hygiene. I think that's, uh, that's a crux of most of the projects. If you notice, it's self-evident that I was trying to pitch my Christmas wish list to GCF because we also need blended cost. Our interest rates has gone up. So we're hoping that we could kind of average down the cost of lending because our uh, demographics in the developmental MSMEs, farmers, cooperatives, communities really look forward to our government financial institutions like Land Bank here, our, our sister, to giving them the best concessionary rate. And we've got not only to manage that expectation, what we got to have to deliver. So we really look forward to uh, GCF. And as I said, I'm, the, I'm a freshman here. So that's how I compose my Christmas list. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much. Now I see the screen is flashing end, uh, but I hope GCF colleagues in the room were taking good note of all of those excellent suggestions uh, from the panel uh, in terms of how GCF can collaborate within this space of greeting the financial systems. I think once again, thank you for sharing your insights. What's come through uh, really clearly here today is sort of that range of measures that really need to be taken um, in greening the financial system at multiple levels. And we're talking about having, you know, financial products that can actually be taken up pretty enthusiastically by people on the ground, by households, by communities, uh, by MSMEs. We're talking about having lenders who are ready to embrace, I think, green financial innovation, uh, and then having that commitment as well to, to shift their portfolios, Ruth, as you talked about. And then, of course, the methodologies and tools to actually in, enable that decision making uh, at all levels. So please join me, uh, those in the room and also online for you listening. Uh, in, think, in thanking our wonderful panel uh, here today. And with that, I think I'm looking for Scott. There he is. So I'm just going to hand back to Scott for I think what will be the final uh, plenary of today. Thanks.